thank you dr sangeeta and uh, team from it and invest india this is dr ashni agarwal and i work at a company called applied materials this is uh, the world leader in uh, semiconductor equipment manufacturing i will be give, taking you through the basics of semiconductor manufacturing technology okay uh, the concepts the practice and uh, actually an industry overview also so this is a series of primers that i am conducting literally the flow that we are taking is the semiconductor basics semiconductor manufacturing process the sort of device types you encounter the industry and today i may or may not uh, beyond uh, the very basics of atm to wide band gap semic semiconductors in india options if i don't you'll find them coming in the session tomorrow and tomorrow's session is again sorry about this but i did conduct this session a year back and tomorrow's session will pick up the loop here and start from the evolving frontiers one and cover advanced packaging which is assembly test marking and packaging of semiconductors okay and then uh, eventually over a period of time i hope to take uh, you through wideband cap semiconductors and mams and uh, overall view of an india strategy and i will likely announce those dates uh, later this week after consulting my team okay so this is a quick uh, view of how this is program and we are you know we take uh, a straight away running dip into the session i want to give you a quick overview or uh, an introduction of applied materials the company that i am in and uh, its role in the semiconductor industry as foundation step to uh, this entire presentation and uh, applied materials is a company which is uh, over 50 years old at this point of time we celebrated our 50th year uh, uh, four years back and it is the uh, world's largest manufacturer of not materials we don't actually sell materials we sell tools that make materials and what we call tools are actually the uh, plant and equipment that is used for manufacturing uh, uh, you know semiconductor devices uh, and literally people know of our company they say when you say intel inside applied material is a company inside intel and literally every chip in the world would have been touched by an applied tool in its production cycle every chip manufacturer is our customer and we have a very substantial position in the world of semiconductor equipment making so you can get a feel of what we do when you take a look at this uh, image down there at the bottom if you can take a look at this image down there and you see these people sitting in the extreme uh, lower right corner lower left corner that will give you an idea of the scale of equipment that we make okay uh, some of the equipment can be as big uh, as to make a whole truck move inside them okay and uh, we are really the equipment maker to the semiconductor industry we are the world's largest semiconductor equipment maker and uh, we have a 60% footprint in an intel factory okay the world's number 2 uh, is a european company that has a 25% footprint in a typical intel factory uh, what they make we don't make what we make they don't make okay and really speaking uh, each of us have major market shares in our technologies in our, in the equipment that we make so what happens is that the rest of the tool making industry is in that last 15% or it competes with number 1 and number 2 and it's really no competition at all so as i said every chip in the world would have been touched by an applied tool in its production cycle we have been one of the key drivers of the moore's law in the last 5 uh, uh, decades and uh, we have actually taken our innovations into other sectors for example display and we are very strong in display sector as well so just like in chips we say you know any chip you see in the world would have been touched by uh, by an applied two lens production cycle any display you see in the world would have been touched by an applied tool in its production cycle whether it is a led tv lcd tv a smartphone touch screen a tablet a computer monitor you name it they would have been uh, uh, you know touched by an applied tool in its production cycle in a semiconductor chip our technology is creating the circuitry on the silicon wafer on a display in a display factory our equipment is making the circuitry on the glass substrate or in future on flexible sub substrates so you're getting a feel of uh, our uh, capabilities we have really a very very vast uh, suite of equipment portfolios 
and each of these suites can be so specialized and so customized that there could be hundreds and thousands of variants of it literally uh, looking at the uh, richness of the uh, uh, semiconductor industry over the years the number of uh, devices that are there you can well imagine equipment has to be fine tuned for each device for it to give that yield that is required so that is what applied materials position is we are a global leader in nano manufacturing technology uh, solutions we touch semiconductor chips displays solar photovoltaic so uh, uh, you know uh, adani ji has a factory in gujarat called mundra so and we have a 100% share of their characterization and metallization tools that uh, maybe 5% of the footprint of uh, their factory but you can see the technology strength we have we have 100% share of what we do in their factory uh, we are there in flexible electronics energy efficient glass saint gobain chennai is a customer and their energy efficient glass is not a film pasted on a glass it's a nano coating on their glass that has been done with our uh, uh, web tools and uh, uh, you know it's again an area we touch the currency notes that you are uh, handling the color changing security threads that are in it they are perhaps made by a customer of ours somewhere for that highly secure application okay so you're getting a feel of the wide range that we are playing in okay and then we are there in energy storage devices we are uh, entering into uh, uh, medical uh, life sciences arena there's already work happening on pharma uh, sector so we have a pretty deep tech uh, footprint uh, out there and our india footprint is actually spreading that technology innovation curve we have over 5000 employees now uh, we have our head office in india at bangalore and uh, we will have close to about 4000 people in bangalore itself but we have additional people now in chennai bombay new Delhi. and we have recently acquired an operation in coimbatore and uh, therefore we are technically in five people five locations we are it bombay's largest industry partner in uh, 2007 uh, era mighty gave a grant of 50 crores to it bombay to create a center of excellence for nanotechnology you will be happy to know that applied materials gave a matching donation from applied materials applied venture uh, applied foundation and that was for uh, 50 crores and for this reason the facility at id bombay is called applied materials nanotechnology lab it's not a generic name it's named after a company and at the lower left you see our chairperson inaugurating that facility uh, which has been used in the inep program also and uh, we have really built up our engagement with id bombay uh, substantially over the years our total grants to academia in id bombay could be crossing over 80 crores uh, we have given them in uh, 20 2011 we have followed up with a clean lab which is a chemical lab for energy and advanced nano research and we have a separate building uh, given to us by id bombay for our exploration center which is an applied lab the first two labs are totally donated to uh, id bombay and uh, the third lab exploration center is an applied materials or owned uh, materials engineering lab in id bombay which is a dsr approved lab and uh, we have about 35 people based uh, at id bombay doing some very interesting cutting edge research our work and uh, relationship is uh, you know really appreciated by academia today we engage not just with iit bombay we are working with uh, iit delhi with iit kanpur iit chennai you name it uh, iic bangalore we are all we are having deep uh, relationships with everyone and we are really working on making the next generation of innovations a reality so on to this part of the session this is going to be on the basics and we'll be covering uh, uh, basics of uh, semiconductors and the basic semiconductor is what is a semiconductor so in case any of you want to comment on it i am available or shall i go ahead yeah dr agrawal yeah. so uh, basically a semiconductor is a material which is halfway between a conductor and insulator because it can switch between being a conductor or an insulator through specific interventions which can be charging doping or an exercise of uh, uh, triggering uh, a condition on that uh, device to change its state of uh, being a conductor or insulator now this is a very interesting property because literally when you can control 
the properties of conducting or insulating a material, you can use it as a switch. You can make it something through which a current can flow or a current can uh, be stopped. And that can actually determine the logic of specific operations that you want to create. And that logic can really be scaled in such unparalleled manner. You have seen it in our real lives. Okay, so basically the semiconductor material, as you can see in this diagram, is operating as a switch. Okay, the uh, input and output uh, can get connected with the switch or it can get disabled by the switch. And this switch operation can be triggered by a gate which can use a very small fraction of the energy required to uh, change the state of the uh, uh, semiconductor material. The uh, conception of this uh, has been a transistor. The basics of uh, the CMOS, uh, basics of the CMOS technology and the semiconductor devices, and that is nearly 75 years ago that it was created. And uh, uh, the device itself was built up and blown out by Fairchild semiconductors. So the first device was pretty mechanical uh, with very basics uh, in it, but the first silicon chip. Uh, 14 years back, uh, 14 years after that, by Fairchild Semiconductors actually started creating the CMOS technology, which gives very low noise, uh, gives very good power efficiency. And uh, that has been the basis for the semiconductor devices over the years. Literally, the evolution of CMOS actually meant that, uh, you know, you could have very efficient devices created uh, with uh, dramatic improvement in noise fidelity. And uh, this was conceptualized as a simple PN diode with a gate which could control the intervening uh, drain and the intervening junction to create the properties of a conductor, conductance or an insulation. So when we start looking at it, what is the uh, scale at which the transistors have scaled? Uh, it is mind blowing. You have seen examples like this. Uh, uh, time and again. This example shares that if in 1970 the capacity of a chip was 2300 people in a hall, by now, by 2011, this has blown to 1.3 billion or population of China in a hall. Okay, and the Moore's law has seen the scaling up of generations of semiconductor devices. So, what is Moore's law? Moore's law is something very simple. It says the number of transistors in a given area will double every two years. That means the literally it's saying that the performance of the transistor will scale up. The performance of a semiconductor chip will scale up every two years. And literally what's been happening is this two years has become two years and then one and a half years. And uh, it's actually been a crazy roller coaster ride on which the numbers have been scaling up. Have you heard of fabs with node size of 180 nanometer, 130 nanometer, 90 nanometer, 65 nanometer, and 45 nanometer, or 28 nanometers? Uh, let me tell you yeah, how we these. Are aware of. Yeah, we are aware of. So you know how these figures come. Why is it 180 nanometers? Why is it not 150 nanometers? Why is it 90 nanometers? Why is it not 100 nanometers? Okay, it is because if you take these figures, if you take these figures and multiply it by 0.7. Take 500 nanometer multiplied by 0.7, you get uh, 350 nanometer. Multiplied by 0.7, you are coming closer to 250 nanometer. Multiplied by 0.7, you get it 180 nanometer. Multiply by 0.7, you're going to get to 130 nanometer. Multiply by uh, 0.7, you're getting 90 nanometer. Multiply by 0.7, you're coming to 65 nanometer. Multiply by 0.7, 45 nanometer. So literally, you are seeing that the node size, the size of the smallest device that can be made with that technology on a wafer, it is reducing by 0.7 every two years. That is the Moore's law. What the Moore's law says that the number of transistors in a given area will double every two years. So if the width and the length defining that particular device reduces by 0.7 then the area will reduce 0.7 into 0.7 or will become 0.5 that is the Moore's law that is how the node size is reducing by 0.7 you know every Moore's law cycle 
And what is really happening is Moore's law is actually just a fictitious innovation law. It is, however, become a simple basis for an entire industry like semiconductors to converge on different parts of the ecosystem saying, what can I do to go to the next level of node size in one and a half years? Because that's where the rest of the uh, industry is going to be. And everybody is focused on trying to see how they can make the next 0.7 uh, uh, redu reduction of uh, the device size, the node size, feature size happen in reality. Now, this also has a lot of other implications. If you actually are uh, reducing the feature size, it has an impact on the power consumption, which actually halves every two years, which is a good functional gain for uh, uh, semiconductor devices. And uh, the speed will improve uh, by 30% in every two years in the same cycle. Simply, uh, there is a calculation here on the system and you can actually go back and take a look at it uh, when the slides are published. And the key message is, it's actually, this is what the Moore's law is. This is how you get your node sizes at different length. Okay, and implementing it has resulted in dramatic scaling up of the chip uh, density on uh, uh, the device density on a chip. So now that you have a feel of it, you can also see in this table the impact of the wafer size. Okay? And uh, the wafer size have also evolved over the years. So way back when they started, you know, they actually had a two inch coupon or a two inch wafer size. OK, and you still have a two inch wafer size in uh, experimental fabs like uh, IIC uh, Bangalore. OK, but when you start moving into commercial operations, they scaled it up to six inch and then to eight inch and then to 12 inch. And actually, it's not exactly eight inch. It's not exactly 12 inch because 200 millimeter is not exactly eight inch and 300 millimeter is not exactly uh, 12 inch. But the 200 mm and 300 mm technologies of uh, at the turn of the century, it was 200 mm. And then by the end of that decade, it became 300 mm. And 300 mm is right now the wafer size which the industry is continuing to work on. It's a fact that uh, the uh, semiconductor industry had also looked at 450 nanometers as the next scale up uh, of the wafer size. But then it found that the effort involved was too much, the accuracy is uh, not that uh, uh, profound. And by and large, because the cost structures, they remained at 300 millimeter. And what is the significance of going from 200 to 300, you know, or 150 millimeter to 200 millimeter to uh, uh, 300 millimeter? The significance is the number of devices that you can get on that particular wafer increase. So anyway, if you increase the area, you should get more devices. But the wastage that would take place at the edge, that decreases by proportion. And since the yield increases, there's more efficiency in going for a larger wafer size. And therefore, for larger runs, uh, commercial fabs go for 300 mm. That is how the industry has actually been evolving. So the basics are very simple. You actually use what is known as a PN a diode as one of your fundamental devices. And this is actually the trigger for uh, an e evolution of uh, this is the uh, is the transistor which can be a, a combination of uh, the p device with n device with a p device okay where the uh, combination can actually create uh, uh, you know junction barriers or with an appropriate trigger create uh, a current uh, larger current which can actually flow through the complete device and the trigger for that is actually the gate current, uh, the gate voltage, which uh, can make the uh, make or break the uh, performance of uh, the uh, transistor. So, as I said before, the CMOS architecture has really evolved. The original uh, the, the devices, which were PN, uh, with uh, which grew to a tra basic transistor, which was PNP or an NPN, uh, evolved into the MOSFET, where you had a metal oxide gate. Uh, on a silicon, in, 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 uh, you know, uh, insulator. So you can see here, there is a silicon oxide layer, and on that there is a metal oxide gate, and this would improve the uh, the efficiency of the gate control. And then uh, what Fairchild did was it used a combination of MOSFETs in what was called a CMOS architecture, uh, where it was the you know the power consumption was only when the switch was taking place. So the uh, power consumption came down 
the noise uh, immunity improved and because of that CMOS evolved as the basic uh, semiconductor uh, logic architecture and it has remained that way for the last 50 years. So uh, now of course there are other architectures coming in, you have uh, magnetic RAM and other uh, new uh, technologies coming which are beyond the Moore or beyond silicon but we will come to it uh, very shortly. The key message here is this industry has been evolving crazily and uh, each level of reduction is coupled with new innovations, new innovations, new device structures, sometimes new materials, which actually deliver that breakthrough reduction to the next lower feature size. Imagine these devices are getting created in millions in a, in a fab and uh, when, they are, when they are being produced at that rate, uh, where they are so sensitive that just a few seconds or a few uh, uh, minutes exposure, overexposure in an uncontrolled environment can uh, damage the yield that you will get out of that uh, wafer. You realize what is the efficiency to which this industry has uh, driven itself to. So the basic of uh, the semiconductors now, there are actually three versions of it that are evolving. One is uh, more of more, so which is the standard, you see the orange here, the uh, pressure of, you know, doing a dimensional and functional scaling. So today they talk of uh, a 28 nanometer, 21 nanometer, 15 nanometer, 10 nanometer, 7 nanometer, 5 nanometer. And actually, as I'm speaking, you can just hear me out that each of these factors is multiplied by 0.7. And uh, each of these is actually pushing the uh, uh, envelope of uh, dimensional scaling to give that uh, you know functional performance improvements. But again, even the functional performance improvements are now coming under a different uh, pressure point and they are they're facing a brick wall. And uh, really the growth is now taking place on some of the other evolutions like more than more elements. And more than more, more is actually heterogeneous integration. And it is, uh, going and it is getting functionalities from sensors and energy harvesting and these uh, this evolution of cmos need not actually require a functional scaling as a mandate so for example if you are actually looking at creating an accelerometer you may not be able to create it at a five nanometer size you know with any accuracy really if you want that functionality you will have to operate maybe at uh, 90 nanometer or 130 nanometer uh, device uh, design to be able to uh, get some of the sensors to function meaningfully. And then you have uh, uh, beyond CMOS architectures and beyond CMOS architectures here are uh, going to be using technologies like uh, Spintronics. And uh, uh, this is your magnetic RAM concept where what is happening is that you have devices with magnetic polarity and this magnetic polarity switches on appli application of uh, uh, of a trigger so depending on which direction the magnetic uh, polarity is the north or the south you know you are actually getting your zero and one the binary logic to be able to uh, create the uh, device uh, the logic device that you want to create and the advantage of some of these technologies is very clear they they promise a lower power consumption, faster uh, switching actions, a lesser noise uh, implementation. So this is how the uh, these technologies are coming up. And that's a separate chapter uh, of discussion altogether. So now let me actually get into the manufacturing process itself. And uh, while I'm on it, I'll try and cover the semiconductor equipment briefly and I'll talk about fab uh, and uh, we'll try and explore some of the myths of the fab. Uh, construction that have been seen in the Indian market in the past. So we have talked about this, the feature size and the wafer size. And uh, as you can see, depending on the size of the coupon and the size of the feature size, you will get different numbers of chips from a particular die. So if you actually talk of 300 mm wafer made at, at 65 nanometer uh, size, maybe the number of chips you could get if you are talking of uh, one millimeter cross one millimeter uh, uh, chip uh, size, die size, you would get something like maybe 4,000 die, dies out of uh, a particular wafer. 
accounting for some yield and some uh, edge uh, exclusion uh, errors. And uh, if you go take the same thing and you're working on a 180 nanometer technology at uh, uh, on a 200 millimeter wafer at say SCA, uh, you might be down to taking maybe about 100 and 50 uh, devices out of that particular uh, wafer. So you can see how there's a dramatic shift in uh, the cost structures and uh, the uh, yields because you're going to a different uh, technology. And each of these products, they have to be made in a clean room. Uh, that is a mandate. You have to actually run this on a clean room. So uh, before I get into it, let me try and take you into a quick look at how to make a chip. So uh, let me try and take you into a quick view of uh, uh, an applied uh, uh, fab, if I can. Can you Welcome to the Maidan Technology Center, the heart of technology development. At a Can you hear the audio? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Great. So, by materials located in California's Silicon Valley. This facility was named for Dr. Dan Maidan who spearheaded the development of many of the technologies that enabled Applied Materials to become a leading manufacturer of the systems that make microchips. Chip fabrication is perhaps the most complex manufacturing process in existence. It takes hundreds of steps to make a modern microchip and no two chip designs have exactly the same sequence of steps. The Maidan Center is a pilot line that mimics our customers' chip manufacturing facilities. We test and fine tune our systems here and make sure they work to our customers' specifications. The Maidan Center is designed to allow a faster transition to new technologies, to shorten cycle time to production, and to reduce risk for our customers. The clean room contains a complete suite of the machines needed to optimize the chip fabrication process. This is the pre-gowning room. Humans are the biggest source of potential contaminants in the clean room. Just one sneeze, for example, can generate 20,000 particles. To combat this, we wear special clothing called bunny suits which protect the chips from the fragments of hair, skin, and moisture that we shed all the time. We're about to enter a class one clean room, meaning there are fewer than 35 particles bigger than 100 nanometers in every cubic foot of air. That's pretty clean when you consider there are over 8 million such particles in a typical urban environment. Inside the systems, it's 100 times cleaner still. Now let's go and suit up. The Maidan Center Clean Room covers 39,000 square feet, similar in size to a customer's advanced pilot manufacturing line. It's home to about 120 process tools, covering all the different technologies needed to build entire chip structures, including lithography, dielectric deposition, plasma etch, photo mask fabrication, metallization, metrology and inspection, planarization, rapid thermal processing, diffusion and wet processing. Making these tools is what Applied Materials does. But we also have some non-applied systems in the clean room to allow us to run complete process sequences. This unique capability enables Applied Materials customers to test drive our systems using their actual device wafers before installation of the process equipment at their site. Lithography is the process by which circuit patterns are printed on the wafer using a tool called a scanner. To enable us to simulate our customers' advanced chip structures, we've installed a complete lithography cell, including an immersion-capable scanner and a track, a tool that applies and develops light-sensitive films on the wafer. The circuit features that will appear on each layer of the chip are held on a photo mask, which is loaded into the scanner and then printed stepwise hundreds of times across the wafer. About 200 researchers work in here every day. If you've got a PhD, this is the place to be. Can you tell me something about this machine? This is our integrated atomic layer deposition tool. We use this to form the key layers in the transistor. And what are you working on today? I'm developing some new recipes for our customers' next generation technology. Hey, Josephine, what's, what are you working on right now? I'm working on a new R&D development for CBD deposition. And this is a new and cool technology that we're working on, but it's highly confidential, so I can't tell you anymore. No, I won't ask them. Darren, what's it like working in a clean room? It takes a little bit of getting used to, uh, but you learn to gown up fairly quickly, and you also learn to identify people just by looking at their eyes and their glasses. And tell me, how do you cope with the clean room thing? 
Well, it takes a little bit to get used to, but once you're used to it, the good thing is you never have to worry about what you're wearing every day. That's a plus. That's a plus. Hundreds of chips are fabricated at a time on a silicon wafer. These wafers are handled in batches of 25 in these pods, which isolate the wafers from the fab environment as they move from process to process. Between our development wafers and those belonging to our customers, we have a lot of wafers in circulation at any given moment. We have an automated material handling system that can store 70,000 wafers. And the system delivers wafers to various parts of the clean room using an overhead monorail system. All the tools in the clean room are networked through Applied Materials factory automation software, allowing engineers to track equipment performance, schedule processing, and perform diagnostic investigations, all without leaving their desks. So there you have it. A quick look around Applied Materials Made End Technology Center. I hope you found it useful. If you have any questions or you'd like to learn more about Applied's technology, please visit us on the web at appliedmaterials.com. Welcome back. And let me actually share a thought, especially my teams at MIT and Invest India. I promise you, I'll take you into the lab very shortly, the Made and Technology Lab. Uh, we have an AR VR uh, implementation, and I'll issue you the headsets, the AR VR headsets, and you will actually be going through the lab station to station with us when we when we take you uh, uh, through that real uh, uh, augmented. Uh, real life, uh, you know, immersion. So look forward to that and quickly on to the chip making. So chip making has uh, these uh, steps that are there. You start with sand, you actually uh, put it in um, a big dekchi and you uh, heat it, uh, uh, melt it, refine it, take out uh, uh, from a seed crystal, you grow that entire ingot, uh, you polish it, slice it, create the wafers, then those vapors are taken into uh, the fab for uh, uh, pattern formation and you're creating the devices on it. And then after you've done the devices, which is uh, the front end processing of the wafer, then you start doing the back end processing, which is actually connecting these transistors up, up, up into the uh, final uh, global interconnect for uh, uh, connecting onto the packaging. And the packaging is uh, a process where you take the wafer, dice it, uh, uh, you know, um, test it, dice it, uh, mark it, package it, uh, and uh, then those are delivered to the customers for uh, to the end industries for incorporating in their uh, devices. So uh, that's a very quick look at it. Uh, you're now looking at uh, devices which are uh, having billions of millions of uh, uh, transistors per uh, uh, device, and if you actually dissect the architecture. This is how it could actually look. You have at the very lowest level here uh, is, is the, uh, the device itself. And then after that, you see there are multiple layers of interconnect. And you know from the base uh, interconnect that could be there on a device to the top interconnect and the solder bump that will you be seeing in a ball grid RAA chip. You know, the size of the interconnect can grow uh, by a clear tenfold order of magnitude. That means whatever is the size of an interconnect here, the final thing would be a thousand times thicker at the top uh, uh, level of this skyscraper. Each of these levels are created in process in in a uh, in a fab, which are integrate uh, intricate. There can be up to 150, maybe a few hundred steps in creating some of the more advanced chips. Uh, you have a lot of detailing taking place at each step to make sure that the integrity of the device is maintained and you can take out uh, the output with the le least uh, uh, degradation of the yield of the, uh, the, uh, of the wafer. And uh, well, uh, the basic steps are very simple. This is what happens. You have a wafer. So you're now seeing a wafer, which is a round, uh, you're actually seeing it uh, uh, by from the sides you see a silicon wafer and this is uh, layered by what is called an api layer epitaxial growth of silicon oxide and this is done in a furnace you actually create this epitaxial layer which is a soft insulator on the uh, silicon uh, wafer and then you actually do lithography etching and implantation annealing and this is from a book 
So it is not having all the details. Before you do that, after oxidation, there are lots of other steps. You do what is known as creation of shallow trench isolations. So literally, what is STI? Imagine, you know, I'm in a colony in, uh, in uh, uh, my city. And in this colony, all the plots are demarcated. Okay. So the STI or shallow trench uh, uh, isolation is isolating each of these plots or each of these devices from each other and clearly saying this is an area where there is this device and this is an area where there is this uh, device and it is uh, creating separate plots for it on that wafer device uh, area on that on that diet then after you have done the shallow trench uh, isolation you will actually do a nitride coating on it so you are trying to further insulate and create conditions where they, in the STI process the devices are further isolated then you do etching on it selectively and you start creating your uh, uh, devices so you will create the implants where there are a particular type of a doping uh, the P device, the N device, and then you will create the junctions. And after you've created the junctions, you will ultimately create the gate. So these are some of the processes that have to take place to create that device. And uh, you uh, do a lot of patterning and you do a lot of etching to, you know, uh, shape that entire architecture, that building on that plot that you have earmarked for creating a device. As you can see, wherever you are cutting out the silicon oxide or the insulator and expose, exposing the silicon below, and you will then start creating the specific doping to give it uh, the special uh, uh, properties. Those dopants are further annealed using, uh, uh, you know, they are, they, they are diffused into the silicon using processes of annealing, which is soft heating. Okay, and this process itself is is again uh, it, it has evolved with a huge range of uh, furnace equipment. Right now, I'm showing on this a very basic oxidation of silicon process, and you're controlling the flow of uh, uh, specialty gases in it, which will be semiconductor grade oxygen, nitrogen, other gases which will go into this furnace, which has uh, the uh, wafers mounted on a tray, and uh, this is controlled. Uh, by specific recipes to uh, time to which they will be exposed in a dry or a wet process and at the end of it you'll get a specific thickness of silicon oxide on it okay which is measured cleared then it will go into the next process out there the resist coating is again uh, uh, there are photo resists available and uh, you coat the wafer for patterning and you have different types of wafers which will react with different types of light and uh, uh, the uh, functionality could be of uh, eating away the uh, photoresist or eating away the uh, pattern. So depending on uh, the type of uh, resist you have, you get different types of uh, patterning capabilities. And you do it by exposing the uh, photoresist to a specific light at a specific uh, wavelength. And because of uh, the reaction of the photoresist with light, you actually do all the lithography in rooms which are inert to the light which can react and damage your photoresist, which can damage the pattern. And that light is the yellow light. So a lot of time the lithography rooms are also called the yellow rooms because they have the yellow light. You control the uh, uh, fineness of your patterning by the sort of li light that you will use for uh, uh, patterning and that is the wavelength of the light and uh, the uh, optical diffraction index which could be applicable and uh, uh, this is a very very sophisticated process uh, there can be uh, in a, a current generation uh, lithography you know you could have hundreds of steps at this level also and the yield can really really suffer if you don't uh, have the skill or the right equipment to execute in this area and the impact of that yield it, it's 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 dramatic because uh, in the end uh, if your uh, wafer output is bad then your cost per device is going to go uh, sky high so the way these wafers are done as you can see they are put in a stepper and a stepper is where you know 
there is a mask or a reticle. Reticle is the name of that patterning mask, which is uh, going to cast that image of the, the semiconductor device pattern onto the silicon wafer. And you actually step that uh, reticle across the semiconductor wafer. So now, of course, we are talking of a UV lithography. And uh, there's a huge technology innovation which has gone in uh, trying to develop this particular product. It's uh, just come into the market over the last year or so. Each unit uh, equipment can cost maybe about uh, $150 million or so. And it is not available off the shelf as our friends in China have discovered. The uh, geopolitics has blocked the sale of some of these devices to certain political uh, uh, politically sensitive countries in today's world. So what is really happening is that uh, you do not actually use lenses for it. You use mirrors and you use uh, a very different technology to actually bend and create that pattern on uh, on a wafer. Beyond optical lithography, you have other types of lithography arrangements. There's electron beam lithography. There is electron projection lithography. You have uh, sort of a device, nano imprint, which is a stamping technology. What is not mentioned here is the inkjet uh, patterning technology, which is being uh, innovated by applied materials also. And there is a version of it, which is already in market by uh, some of the players in the display uh, sector. So you have all these to create a pattern. So you create in the uh, design house a, a pattern, and that pattern is transferred to a reticle or a mask. And that from that mask, an image is brought onto the wafer. And now on the wafer, whatever is going to happen is what applied material really specializes. So any material deposition, any material doping, etching, cleaning, uh, me measuring what is happening, the physical process is where applied materials to start playing. So you have different types of etching processes. Uh, isotropic, you know, it can be uniform in direction or anisotropic, which is straight, which cuts straight. As you can see in the second diagram, the uh, cut is very straight. And this is also known as dry etch or reactive ion etching system. And it can be uh, very uh, focused plasma uh, action, which could actually create it. And it, it is what will create a very precise pattern on, on a wafer. This is the sort of cuts very precise cuts that you can get out of it. And then another process is of iron implantation. And uh, here you accelerate uh, the dopant material and you uh, bombard it on the surface of the wafer or the target and you actually control the energy with which you do it and uh, you you get uh, an, uh, you know ions implanted on it. And this is on the left side, the uh, equipment that we make. And to really understand what it does, just realize that this is one and a half times the size of grown up man. So a man would be somewhere around this size. So you can imagine the size of the ion implanter, magnets, accelerator and uh, target. And this is this is what it is uh, and very uh, high voltage levels in it. Uh, uh, very dangerous can only be handled by trained staff, uh, all the equipment and uh, safety is a very key training that we do for our customers on all the equipment that we are providing them patient. So you have different types of doping, which can be gas source, solid source, in situ, or uh, uh, you know, while the process is happening when, when you're doping, doping it. And you control the depth to which you do it, the properties you create, uh, they are very, very precisely controlled to meet the recipe of the device that you're going to work on. And uh, we have talked of all that. So diffusion and annealing, let me tell you, is a whole subject in itself. So uh, the furnace annealing, it can take minutes and cause uh, a soft diffusion of uh, the dopant into the uh, device, into the substrate. But then today you have, you know, flash annealing and flash annealing takes in a few milliseconds. OK, fraction of a second. And then you have micro annealing where very pointed annealing uh, can take place. So, you know, there, there's a whole lot of innovation that is happening. And, uh, uh, you know, this is a very specialized subject in itself. Thin film deposition, which is fundamental to the 
uh, entire uh, uh, manufacturing process of semiconductors uh, takes uh, crystalline uh, uh, silicon and does a whole lot of depositions on it. And uh, these play of thin films actually creates uh, the final device. So you have uh, uh, a combination of silicon uh, uh, substrate, then you have doped material and different conductances, and you have dielectric material, you have metal uh, depositions, all of these. All of these are uh, uh, going to create that final device. And uh, uh, in sputtering, you are actually doing that uh, deposition of your you know, material onto a target substrate. Uh, physically, you are depositing that uh, material by doing sputtering on it. And uh, all these things where you are uh, working on depositing the, uh, uh, when you are doing these uh, vapor depositions, whether physically or chemically, you know, you are using showerheads or special types. You can just imagine a showerhead in your bathroom and how water flows through it. So you have gases flowing through these showerheads and they are bombarding that silicon wafer. And uh, they, they are, the temperature is being controlled in the semiconductor manufacturing chamber. Okay, it is controlling the flow, it's controlling the temperature, it's controlling the gases that are going to be there, it's controlling the electrical environment where the plasma is going to play. And it is a very capricious environment. You know, you, how do you control it to the uh, level of uh, uh, nanometers on a 12 inch wafer? Okay, it is, it is a phenomenal technology which is actually driving uh, that innovation. And uh, it's uh, materials technology and it's actually uh, the mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and a whole lot of things which are there, which actually create that final device with that accuracy. And uh, when we talk of chemical vapor depositions, you have low pressure CVD and then you have the plasma enhanced uh, chemical vapor uh, depositions. And uh, you use it for different types of uh, thin film creations. Uh, again, in different environments, vacuum, gases, uh, specialty uh, conditions. These these are used to grow uh, additional layers, epitaxial layers, and you create that final device. And this is called the front end manufacturing process. So if I if I can take the liberty of uh, going back a few slides, and uh, you remember the structure we talked of. Uh, there is this thing you see about the interconnect levels on this skyscraper and you see the device down there at the ground floor level so the front end manufacturing is a ground floor level manufacturing the back end of the line is this interconnect creation at the uh, uh, levels above the base device and uh, this is one way of looking at how these name the nomenclature has come up Okay, but really speaking, really speaking, the interconnect is also called the back end uh, because uh, it is it is uh, where uh, the temperature that is that is going to play is at a different level. The uh, device has been created. You can't have too high temperature in the back end process, and uh, if you have too high a temperature, it will destroy your device. So different conditions it operates in. So it's called the back end process. The device creation is the front end process in the fact. You're seeing some of this uh, here. Uh, typically you have copper interconnects, but you can also have aluminum interconnects. Uh, copper is a very good uh, interconnect in it. You know, in a typical device, uh, there can be nearly 12 and a half miles of effective wiring in a simple uh, de device, but copper has a lot of other uh, constraints also because uh, you can't do a dry etching, you know, and copper, uh, uh, you know, atoms can diffuse into uh, copper molecules can diffuse into silicon. So copper deposition is a technology in itself and it uses what is called as a damascene process. Okay, what you do is before you do a copper deposition in the wire that you're creating, you will create a titanium uh, or a tungsten plug and that in that tungsten plug will you deposit the copper okay then the copper ion will not diffuse out and this copper uh, is deposited in that uh, interconnect 
and then at the next layer what you do is you polish it so you have a dielectric and you deposit uh, a copper in it now this is the metal through which the color current will flow and you are actually going to polish it off so you're removing extra uh, material out of it and the barrier layer is going to prevent copper diffusion and then you have the copper uh, via uh, for the conductance and this this technology where you, know, you are actually removing that extra material by just polishing it off is called damascene uh, copper damascene process and it's named after uh, damascus okay uh, way back uh, uh, you know damascus in syria was famous for the damascus swords and those damascus swords had uh, uh, the steel which was prepared with two uh, different alloys actually blended together polished together to create that final uh, uh, unique sword so this is the copper damascene process something like it and uh, it is actually created by polishing the uh, additional material off and polishing actually is a key part of uh, the entire semiconductor process you do a lot of linearizing a lot of uh, polishing of uh, your device surface throughout the semiconductor process pattern deposit uh, remove that ex extra material with a planarizing action create an uh, interconnect remove that uh, extra material through a uh, planarizing motion this is a typical planarizing head that you are seeing here this will have a rotating uh, head on which a wafer would be put a slurry would be there and a cleaning head would be there and it would have to actually do this in a way that you can actually control the polishing at that nanometer level or you can destroy the uh, device and the this is a part of such a big equipment this is not a small equipment this is a chemical me uh, mechanical planarizing equipment from applied so then you of course once you have created your final device you take it through testing assembly qualification process are getting a feel of the flow uh, the wafer with mass in design photo uh, lithography uh you do uh, uh, photo rest uh, rest uh, patterning stripping and then you go take it through dielectric deposition metallization polishing testing packaging final test this is a broad uh, thing so let's take a look at a fab the fab is like this okay uh it is not a uh, you know uh, in the last uh, fab expression of interest there were people who were uh, negotiating with the government for a thousand acre land okay the fab you saw uh, made in technology center the video that's actually in less than an acre uh, plot okay the building itself will be maybe uh, a fraction of an acre and then you add uh, utility areas and stuff like that that might take a little more but it's not it's not a real estate grab uh, need okay it does need uh, specialized uh, uh, setups but it is not uh, such a huge Uh, setup as uh, people make out to and as you can see it's a multi level building and you have a utility area in semiconductor complex the utility area is in a separate uh, uh, plot not on the, in the same building and their gases are being made there and then you have the clean subfab where all these uh, gases are coming in and the uh, utility distribution uh, uh, setups are created in the uh, subfab and sub fab is normally below the uh, main fab which is the main clean room and uh, in the clean room you have all the equipment and above the clean room is a pressurized zone uh, where you know the uh, you uh, uh, evacuate the uh, uh, gases and other material from the fab so this is the manufacturing process roughly put uh, you have front end uh packaging uh, you know a uh, front end uh, wave, uh, device creation and then the back end is actually or uh, osat or test assembly and packaging and let me tell you osat is uh, for advanced packaging in today's world as lot of fabs they try and capture value by doing the uh, basic uh, uh, the conventional packaging at their own end so if you take a look at the cross section of fab this is giving you again a view you have the equipment and uh, you have the overhead uh, uh, you know uh, material movement uh, uh, tracks and uh, you have the uh, uh, mono rails and production equipment and then you have tall stockers stockers are where the wafers are stocked between uh, production and after production 
This is another view of the uh, wafer manufacturing process. You have a wafer, you take it in epitaxial deposition, do the dielectric deposition, reticle patterning, etching, ion implantation, processing, take it into the interconnect cycles, and then you take it out as a finished uh, wafer. And uh, you can see the uh, two parts, the transfer and the interconnect part there. Then this is another view of the same thing. You know how it works. You have a wafer and it comes in epitaxial deposition, litho patterning, uh, etching. Uh, you take it through multiple rounds of device creation processes. And finally, uh, the process wafer is taken out uh, for assembly and testing. OK, uh, this is a key part of the entire factories today is the material control system. People don't realize it. But uh, in a typical fab, that can be uh, maybe $100 million or more investment. Uh, simply because, uh, as you can see, these are the, uh, it's a reality. When you're producing stuff at that higher pace, uh, you're processing uh, wafers at that higher pace, its movement across the entire fab is a big challenge. You have, uh, you know, thousands of wafer in different stage of processing across different devices. You have to know what you're stocking where, what condition it is in, how much <laughs> it has taken. So it becomes a very critical uh, uh, requirement. Okay, and typical material uh, handling control system can be a uh, fully automated uh, execution. This is how a typical FAB can look. I'm just trying to now take you through some layouts. Okay, uh, utility room, uh, the yellow room or the litho room, the white room or the room storage. Smoke room is where you do the gowning. And uh, this is because uh, yellow light is used to prevent erosion of photo risk. Uh, the, uh, this is the white room or where the production equipment is. And on this, at the top, you see this. This is actually uh, the automated material handling system. It's mind blowing when you see it operating on its own with all the robots and material handling equipment moving on its own, delivering uh, the uh, uh, wafers into different devices, taking it out after processing, stocking it in, uh, you know, ap uh, appropriately and uh, then, uh, you know, uh, taking it to the next stage. This is a possible FAP campus layout. You know, I have tried to, you know, I used to, I, I made it uh, actually to tell uh, various stakeholders in the last UI that it is not such a big project uh, uh, size that people are projecting. You have a parking, green area, Reception and meeting area, office building, fab, which is a multiple story building. Okay, and uh, on the clean room area, you have a windows walk area, common utility uh, uh, building, and then you have a water treatment plant, effluent treatment plant, substation, and specialty gases area. And then there is an ATMP block somewhere where the devices, the finished wafers are being diced and packaged. Now, that is for a conventional packaging, of course. Now, you actually take this and we even built up a layouting out there with sizing and everything built out to show what it means. And then we took this and explained that in a typical setup, uh, you know, you would actually look at creating multiple fab buildings. Okay, so you would define at the start that you're going to have over the next 15 years, maybe four fabs. Okay, and you would actually provide for it. You don't have to do everything on day one. But you need to provide for land uh, accordingly. You, you, you can get a feel of uh, the uh, execution art here. And uh, as we shared, actual lot area was in this thing turning out to be 25 acres. Okay, for four fab, that means projecting growth across uh, 15 years, providing for four fabs, uh, uh, four lines, fab lines over that period. And you know everything design center was uh, it had a design center it had an office block atmp everything was provided in just blowing that myths out now let's take a look at the device types so you are having wafer manufacturing processing dicing packaging okay and packaging you do the die attach you attach the die to a substrate do the wire bonding do the encapsulation to protect it from environment test it and deliver it that's the conventional packaging basics of it Okay, uh, you have devices which could be analog, digital, or mixed. Uh, digital is only zero and one. Okay, presence or absence of voltage. Analog will be precise properties to 
enable specific uh, real world uh, signal processing. Uh, another definition is using the, uh, the semiconductor industry association framework which defines logic, memory, and discretes as well. And then there is what is known as the Oppenheimer framework, which actually again evolves and des uh, describes the various devices depending on the functionality. So the fact of the case is in a typical end market, market application, you have a whole range of devices, which can be your analog processors, digital processors, system processors, memory system enabling devices. In future, you're going to have uh, the IoT uh, world where you will have sensors and you have uh, other uh, uh, elements in play, which will be at a different node size. And therefore, it's going to be a very industry, uh, industry to play in. The industry has been growing. Last year, it was $400 billion. Okay, despite everything, and you know they are saying that this year it's going to push uh, 500 uh, billion dollars. Touching every sector, it is now a meta uh, device. Electronics is everywhere. Uh, semiconductor chips are everywhere, and the numbers will only grow. You know, uh, we ourselves are taking our technologies into life sciences, into pharma, into so many other areas. You can, uh, you know, it's mind blowing what applied materials R&D is doing in India. Uh, you have uh, uh, the supply chain, which is from an end user interfacing with a retailer or distributor, OEM, the uh, original design manufacturer, the EMS, semiconductor distributor, vendor, foundry and uh, assembly and test. We are so far upstream. To a great extent, it doesn't matter to us what is the uh, Indian policy on whether to have a fab or not. Because as long as you're having a demand, our product will be selling somewhere. Okay, but the supply chain itself is very complex. Okay, it is evolving. It is going through total fermentation. We will take this up as a separate uh, chapter, but you know, the fact remains, it is a big opportunity, even for a nation. It's, it's a big opportunity where you create infrastructure, you create tools, you create materials handling, you create utilities, and at the end, the supply chain. Just apply applied materials, supply chain, uh, we buy $3 billion worth of outsourced material from Asia-Pac every year. Our global outsourcing from Asia-Pac is $3 billion. We have taken a goal in the Applied Materials India that we will like to have at least $100 million or 1,000 crores actually of sourcing from India in the next three years. And the trouble is the ecosystem doesn't exist here. If we want uh, the utility gas, specialty gas distribution pipes, they require to be made in very special conditions. There can be no contamination in it. Okay, if we want uh, uh, certain ceramics, again, they are of a different type. And yet, we have worked on it. We have identified some vendors over the last one year in India, some of which are filing for their manufacturing application under specs. And let us hope that things evolve in this ecosystem. The semiconductor design landscape, uh, India, has some strengths. We have a strong MNC Global Engineering Center base in India, but our startup base is very weak. And uh, we do have a serious exposure to China because uh, if we actually take a look at it, uh, we don't have any startup base worth its while. We are at a very uh, basic level uh, of manufacturing of uh, you know design capabilities. And really speaking, you need a fab with your design uh, sector to be able to make your designs to market in time. Imagine if there is something being made in a fab in Malta. Okay, and there is a design issue and they say, aapka design hai, we have stopped it, it is not working right. What will the designer sitting here do? Unless he's there on the spot trying to work with the fab operators to make sure that the uh, 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 production is taking place efficiently. And if it is not taking place efficiently, your design can get bumped down the, uh, uh, you know, the manufacturing timeline and you will then slowly get bumped out of the market as you fail to meet the market expectation on the turnaround time. So somewhere it's a, a thing that you have to look at it very strategically, many paths to that execution. And I'm sure the government will find some answers. The uh, uh, OSAT stands for outsource assembly and test. So when we talk tomorrow, the packaging uh, sector, I'll come into more details on it. It's not as easy as people think that, you know, we can do uh, ATP in India. It's an easier path uh, to market. 
uh, no, the challenges are just the same as creating a fab. And please believe me, uh, Applied has no interest in making this statement. We make equipment for advanced packaging as well. So we have no interest in it. We're just cautioning that please have your premise right as you go and take a decision on some of those things. And you need to start from your market to make things happen. We even work back with the government at a point of time to give them demand modeling uh, suggestions and then play uh, their strategy accordingly. Let us see how that comes. That also brings me to the final point. You know, a lot of people think India cannot do it. Uh, fact of the cases, India has done it. Uh, we have done, uh, you know, chips out of uh, SEL and we have nothing to be shy of. People think it's a 180 nanometer line. Why? Uh, that's that's an obsolete technology. No, it's 180 nanometer line for strategic application. And if you watched movies like uh, uh, Broken Arrow, okay, do you remember that there is an electromagnetic pulse that comes in it and the helicopter crashes? For strategic applications, EMP is a real thing. You know, somewhere in India, there are facilities which are EMP protected to an extent that if there is a nuclear war, the last resort is protected and they can still attack uh, and do a counterattack on anyone who dares to attack us. So just imagine, imagine that you are actually looking at creating chips for uh, uh, EMP protection. They're called radiation hardened chips. Imagine you are creating chips for your space program. In space, the radiation, all, all chips have to be radiation hardened. Okay. Uh, those are the chips that are getting made at uh, SCL Chandigarh. And those chips are not made at 5 nanometer or 28 nanometer or 45 nanometer. They are all made at a higher feature size. Okay, so we have nothing to be defensive about. There is a society called Radiation Hardened uh, Chip Society of America. And they are at 350 nanometers. Okay, a lot of times uh, we denounce what we do. We did not have the technology for radiation hardened chips that was not given to us by Israel. And yet our people have done it. We have nothing to be defensive of. I think we have made over 120 chips and 40 chips out of SCL Chandigarh. And it's amazing what has been done out of there. Okay, so the key message, I think semiconductor manufacturing is a critical element of NEP. Uh, somewhere it will create huge opportunities Okay, we are now realizing, you know, in 2014 era, there were a lot of vested interest who floated. We don't need to uh, look at semiconductor manufacturing. Global semiconductor fabs are, uh, you know, underutilized. And we said, where are you seeing that? We gave data from um, the uh, Gartner data for fab utilization across a decade. And it was always at 83%. Okay, 80 to 83%. He said, why are people making these statements? They don't have facts. They're just trying to cloud the issue. The issue is not fab being underutilized. All fabs, they are, you know, the industry has fabs which are mainstream fabs which will be heavily loaded. There are new fabs which are coming in at cutting edge which will be underutilized. And there are fabs which are at uh, obsoleting edge. There it will be the utilization will be uh, lower than uh, average. Uh, it's it's normal. What you're seeing is normal. So by and large, tremendous tremendous opportunity there. Uh, we ourselves are excited about it. Our India teams uh, doing interesting work and hopefully somewhere uh, India's visions here will shape over this uh, over the next few years. Let's see that happen.